to the Data Stack Show. Today, we're going to talk with Boris from Census, and it's categorized as a reverse ETL tool, but I have a sneaky suspicion that Costas is going to ask about the reverse ETL terminology. But what I'm going to ask about is, you know, what's interesting about Census, so, you know, taking data from the warehouse and, and pushing it out to other tools in the stack, is that it kind of assumes that there has to be some value created in the warehouse beyond just the raw data that was loaded there, however. And so I wanna know what Boris is saying as far as how, you know, how does that impact the way that he thinks about customers, their product that they're building and the ways that companies are trying to do that, right? I mean, DBT is obviously sort of a new way, um, but I'm really interested in that. How about you, Casas? Well, first of all, I have to, figure out who came up with the term reverse ETL. Oh, yes. The etymology of tech terms is <laughs> such well, a tasty subject. Yeah, I mean, it's more of a marketing term, probably, to be honest. But it's something that, like, because I have also the suspicion. I mean, you know, like, Census is more, probably like, the first company that um, was, like, in this space. I mean, uh, so uh, it probably has to do with them. Like, it's mm. something that's yep. like, related to them. So I want to learn, like, what's the... Uh, the story behind it. And outside of this, um, I want to uh, ask Boris and like try to understand what's the difference between getting data, for example, from Marketo and pushing into the data warehouse and doing the inverse, which is take mm. from the data warehouse and push it back to Marketo. Like where are like the different challenges there? Why they're different? Why we need different tools? Um, and who is using? Is the user the same? Like, why do we have different product categories at the end? That's what I want to yeah. uh, understand. And I hope he's the right person like, to have this conversation. Well, let's go find out. Let's do it. Boris, welcome to the Data Stack Show. Hey, nice to be here. All right, give us the brief background on where you came from and what you do today at Census. Where I came from. So uh, originally from Canada, if, if that's the, the real meat of the question. Uh, <laughs> it's mainly uh, a geographic question. Yeah, yeah it's a geographic <laughs> question. Uh, I'm a Canadian who lives in San Francisco uh, through a variety of stops along the way. Uh, but my career started at Microsoft. I have always been a tool builder. So I started my career on what I consider kind of the ultimate tool, which is Visual Studio, which uh, has, you know, is the, is, is the tool that tool builders use to make software. So it's a uh, it's a particularly interesting challenge to start your career in. Um, and I spent quite a few years working on developer tools. And then about a decade ago, I started my first company that was actually uh, in the field of what you call identity management uh, and single sign-on for the people that kind of know these things. And that, uh, after I sold that company, it kind of, my brain stayed tuned to what I call, you know, these kind, of, kind of data silo problems, data federation problems, and uh, very quickly kind of re-centered on th this, uh, this problem that, that we attempt, like started to solve in 2018 uh, with, with Census, which was to get kind of data from product and analytics teams out into the rest of the business. We were just frustrated by the, the lack like, of bridging between those two worlds. And so that's, that's how our company is born. And so today I'm the the CEO of Census and uh, you know we, we've we're, we're mostly based in San Francisco in the U.S. I think kind of a mix at this point of uh, like 50-50 kind of uh, remote and uh, uh, in San Francisco and uh, and and you know kind of humming along. Yeah, w one quick question on on the sort of the way that you like notice problems around data silos and other things was that both in your company and with your customers or is, was it primarily something you learned building the company yourself? Um, I guess I see it everywhere. Uh, so like once when, you see, you can't unsee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, great startups, great founders tend to, they, they don't look at like just, you know, they don't look at the world, let's call it from the MBA perspective of like, ah, there's a market opportunity there. <laughs> they just want to build something, right? right? And which I don't, I don't knock like mar identifying market opportunities. Uh, but <laughs> but I, I, I find that you tend to get obsessive about trying to solve a problem, mm, either that yeah. you've experienced or that you see and you can't unsee. In my case, it was both. So uh, when I 
when I see software as a service and, and I see people u- using all the amazing apps, right? Some of our customers have like 300 apps, if you can imagine that, uh, um, in their organization. I think that's wonderful, right? That means that lots of people get to use the tools that they want. People can be productive. There's, uh, you know, people have best of breed user interfaces and, and all that stuff. But invariably, and I, I maybe other people don't see it as immediately as I do, but I just can't mm-hmm. not see it, is data is replicated ad hoc across all of these applications. Mm-hmm. And what is the data? Well, it's the same kinds of things over and over again. Uh, and and that feels wrong to me, right? And, and I feel like we need to help solve that problem. Uh, and so there's all sorts of tools that have existed over the decades to try to solve what people call data integration. It's not like a new concept. And uh, the kind of unique perspective we brought to it when we started the company in 2018 was there, there was this treasure trove of data in data warehouses and product analytics teams and product teams that everyone on the product and engineering side used. We all were very comfortable using those things, whether that's from your operator console or from your amplitude analytics tool, whatever, right? Like we were all living yeah. and breathing it and sales and marketing and success and support teams were not. Uh, mm-hmm. And so we built this bridge, right? That went from the data warehouse out towards the, the, the business tools. And in 2018, that was a weird and novel thing. Uh, so people didn't even know what to, to, to kind of call this. Yeah. So how did we come up with the term reverse ETL? And right. who came up with this term? Yeah. So when we first started, this was in approximately... August 2018, August, yeah, August, September 2018 is when we were building the first version of Census and we're talking to our first customer. The, our customers, our first two, three customers, basically on their own decided to describe our product as reverse five tran. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, if I were really specific, because they knew five. No way. That's great. And so they did that, right? We were just kind of like, Again, you'll meet a lot of first-time founders. You're like, like, how do you describe your product as a classic conundrum? And people get too complicated. They use buzzwords. So we were just like, goes connects to your data warehouse. And you know, we, we were keeping it real simple and we weren't trying to complicate it with buzzwords. And then they were like, oh, so it's kind of like five trend in reverse. And we're like, yes, that works for you. That's a great, like, let's go with that, right? <laughs> uh, um, now, of course, we didn't put that on our website. That would seem really weird. Uh, uh, but, but in, in colloquial speech, like th- that's how people were reasoning about our software. And obviously, you're not going to launch your company that way. Uh, so, you know, in our first year back in 2018, 2019, we were just going around finding our first customers, just, you know, getting them on the product and, and riffing on all sorts of ways in which we could call this. And funny enough, uh, around... June, I'm going to say June, July, August of 2019, around there. I'm sorry, yeah, 2019. Uh, one of our customers was actually working in tandem with uh, folks at Fishtown Analytics, which is now DBT Labs. Yep. And they, they were actually, for the folks who might not know, because now it feels like ancient history, but the company that builds DBT was originally... Uh, selling consulting services rather than selling the software. Sure, yeah. And uh, the so one of our customers was consulting with them. So they were they were paying for our software and they were developing really cool uh, a really cool data stack. And they were working with one of the folks at at Fishtown, uh, which we knew the the company existed, but we didn't know anyone there at, at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, she was one of their true, you know, kind of. Uh, uh, she was their first, you know, almost one of their first consultants. She became kind of the community manager. Her name is Claire Carroll. And she started taking notes on what things she was seeing out there when she was working with customers. And so out came like sometime in the summer of 2019, this notion doc that was like, you know, linked off of the internet somewhere, right. Which has long disappeared. Uh, in which she was kind of taking notes. It was literally a page of just notes. And in it, there was this thing going like, and then there's this census thing, like reverse ETL, um, which from her perspective, it's like, instead of branding it reverse, five turn reverse, it made sense to just say, oh, it's like reverse ETL. Uh, so that's the first evidence of that word ever showing up in writing in my, in my, to my knowledge. Uh, um, so 
The reason we weren't using that term at the time was I have the unfortunate problem of being like too knowledgeable or too nerdy or too mathematically obsessed or oriented, which is like the word is technically a misnomer uh, uh, since ETL has no direction. Uh, yeah. So it feels weird. <laughs> At least five turn in reverse actually was a reasonable descriptor, right? Yeah. But reverse ETL actually seemed like a mathematically incorrect way of describing the thing, but at least it's a generic term. So, um, so, you know, it was kind of, we, we banded around like, uh, uh, for a while for fun, uh, in, in, in 2019. Uh, and then, and then we launched the product and the company in 2020. Uh, and, and it just very quickly became the, the de facto name for this. Uh, yeah. and far be it for me to, to kind of argue with, the public, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> it doesn't seem like a worthwhile way to spend my time. So, uh, so that's my personal recollection of the 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 kind of birth of that that word. Uh, and then, you know, when we did our Series A announcement, which was in February of twenty twenty one, this all these last couple of years are all blending together. Um, the the then the VC ecosystem landscape machinery kind of kicked into high gear. Oh yeah. Uh, and they, you know, in the same way that engineers like to think about data stacks and, 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 and like venture capitalists like to think in terms of data landscapes or landscapes, uh, everyone famously knows the marketing, uh, you know, landscape that, and now the data landscape is just as complicated and, and, yeah, full of logos. Yeah. and so, you know, this is like the kind of output they like to produce. This is like a success for them. It's like, I've managed to put every logo I've ever heard of into a, <laughs> a single chart I mean, with squares around them. Uh, so, so that's, I think, when reverse ETL really became a household concept is yeah. when it started showing up in those. That is things. some high quality lore. Like even the detail of the Notion doc <laughs> is so, it's perfect. Like it's yeah. perfect. So that's, uh, I, I thank you for that bit of history. Okay. Sorry. My follow-up question to that, Costas, about where the term came from is, okay, so I agree. Like mathematically, it's not, it's not, you know, technically accurate but i think even beyond that my bigger question is um in some ways it's very singular right like a line on the chart you know that you know whatever us in the data industry create or an investor creates but you're building tooling in this space do you think that's a sufficient term to describe at least what you like what you envision that you're building or like the problem you're solving mm. No, I mean you're giving me really too much, uh, uh, too, too much, too too much rope there to t say whatever I want. But um, <laughs> that's the point of the show. Before this call, right? Uh, uh, Costa had described himself as a, a plumber since he had worked in pipelines for so long, um, and I I think there's great pride to be taken in building excellent data pipelines. Something that we pride ourselves on, and I'm sure you do as well. Uh, and our customers do, uh, but it's not what I think the product is actually about. And it's not what excites our users, right? When I think of great software, uh, especially tools, I mean, there's softwares of all, software of all kinds, right? But when you think of great tools, you're actually, you're basically trying to make someone else, right? Your user, kind of a more awesome version of themselves, right? That's just the best way to think about it. And our users are not trying to become really good data pipeline people. That's not, that's not their goal. Uh, and when we started the company, I was not thinking, you know what I'd love to do is just spend my life building great data pipelines. Like that's not what the core animus was. It is absolutely an essential means to, to reach our end. Uh, but the, the, what I wanted to solve and what I get to see with our users every day is I wanted to bridge the gap between what I called analytics and product organizations and the go-to-market organizations like that. I was very frustrated, but that that gap existed. And there are a lot of tools out there that had taken stabs at this, right? Um, famously, you know, there, there were tools like segment that connected the code that you wrote in your app directly into your marketing tools. This was a huge sure. step forward, but I kept seeing this problem that the data organizations that were emerging the BI organizations that were emerging were disconnected from the rest of go-to-market, right? Finance, support, 
sales, like just the whole world of the company. And so that just building that connection was important to me. And you don't just have to build data pipelines to make that work, right? You have to change the relationship between those teams and the data organization. And if you ask data teams all over the world and you ask them what their day-to-day -day life is like, they will tell you that they're really crumbling under kind of load, like support load of getting data requests, having to solve like yet another dashboard. They're very overworked like IT teams, right? And what I felt they needed to move towards and, and what I think Census's underlying goal should be for them is not to make pipelines that run faster than the pipelines they could write. That's a, that's a good to have, right? And I'm glad that our pipelines are superior to the ones you would build yourself. But actually to turn your data organization into a, we use this term a lot nowadays, right? But we really meant it from the beginning, which is like a kind of product or platform team. Mm -hmm. Because it's the only way to serve your whole company at scale. Otherwise, you're just the hated service org, right? You're the <laughs> IT team that no one really likes because everyone's always stuck behind 32 requests. Yep. And, and so that was a huge kind of part of what Census has always been about and, and continues to, to be about, which is, so see, it's not like really about the plumbing. It's about saying, how do I turn the data team into uh, the, the, the most essential part of, of your whole company that everyone else depends on? And, and so that's, you know, uh, I, I kind of, you may have caught me say this, caught me saying this earlier, but I think of Census a lot more as a data federation tool rather than a data pipeline tool. That's why it's called census, because my goal is to say at a company, there should only be one version of the truth. There should only be one census of your users, your data, et cetera. And everything else in the company should be naturally kind of a cache on that data, pulling from that information as seamlessly as possible. And, and that's what census does. Mm -hmm. uh, Boris, can you uh, elaborate a little bit more uh, on how this reverse Five tranity or whatever we want to call it, right? <laughs> it's actually different. And what are the challenges that what Five Tran does not have, right? Like right, right. Pull the data from the apps or the database and push it into the data. Totally, world. totally. Yeah, I mean, this is a great, uh, it's a great question. And and everyone, you know, from the outside of almost any company, any software, any tool, right? People always think it's can't, how complicated can it be? It's reverse Five Tran, <laughs> right? Uh, so as soon as you distill things into like two words, it's like, then you, you somehow lose all the underlying complexity. So, so there's a couple really significant ways in which this is different and, you know, difficult in its own right for people to build. Um, the first is when you're, when you're pulling data from SaaS applications into your warehouse, you're actually dealing with very consistent source data, right? So if you go to you know, all the various ELT tools, right? They'll show you the ERD for all these applications, right? And they're fairly stable. And what you're doing is you're saying, let me get Salesforce and we pull the schema and like dump it into the warehouse. And warehouses to their credit are very easy places to say, here's a table, just dump it, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not trivializing the work of building great pipelines there, but you're, you, you're basically going from a kind of raw data structure that is not changing super often with read APIs off those products that are generally the first API that any SaaS product will build down into a data warehouse, which is of a low N, right? There's only so many data warehouses uh, um, that are fairly consistent at being able to write a raw table in, right? And then all the little details, of course, emerge of trying to get that just right and incremental, et cetera. When you're thinking about this in reverse, the first thing is everyone's data models are different right? You're, you're at the end of the data refinery. So it's not the raw data from Salesforce. That's always the same schema. It's whatever entities your company has evolved, right? What your data organization thinks is essential about your users and your workspaces. And maybe we have, maybe you have a many to many model of your, of your, of your user base versus maybe you don't, right? Maybe it's one-to-one -one or uh, it, it, there are no organizations. It's all just B to, B to C, right? There's all these various patterns are bespoke to your company. And census sits at the, at the, that's where census starts, right? It has to first take your distilled version of the data at the end of all your, you know, tri pipeline and transformations and, and say, okay, we'll work with this, right? And then we have to write into applications. And there's two problems there. One is writing data. The APIs are terrible because most SaaS applications focus first and foremost on like easy read APIs and the right APIs are very heterogeneous, 
very generally very poorly designed. Um, and then if you screw that up, the the damage is really, really high. Yeah. So I think that is the most important aspect of this. So when you think about uh, a product like ours, even if you were to do this yourself, right? So you're an engineer at your company and you're going to build these things. You will generally be reticent to, to do a lot because your upside is like, I got the pipeline done. Who gets promoted for that? And the downside is very significant, right? Because you're going to accidentally put a million things into Marketo that you weren't supposed to put in and no one knows how to delete those things. Guess what? Deleting is hard in, in, in SaaS applications. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so now your marketing team is angry. You've sent emails to the customers that are wrong. So the downsides are, are very high. And mm -hmm. so a lot of what, I, I think that's actually what generally held back this side of the company. Mm -hmm. uh, this is why the product and analytics, uh, uh, you know, like the, 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 that whole world was actually evolving very well because yeah. it's agile. But this side, it's like one project a year, one project a quarter, right? Yep. And so that's really what we were trying to change here. And, and so what do you have to do? You have to validate data more deeply. You have to, you have to do a lot more uh, uh, fine-grained ways of like writing data in. So we have you know, all sorts of different capabilities. You, you can use census to say, hey, I only want to update what's there. I don't want you to create new stuff. Mm -hmm. Or you know, I want you to write into Salesforce, but I also don't want you to overwrite this field if it's already there. Because yeah. again, there's much more subtle stuff going on when you're, when you're in these operational workflows. Like there's, there's an email that's going to come out automatically out of this, right? There's a salesperson who's going to make a phone call an hour later based on what's happening in there. And mm -hmm. so we have a lot more like subtle capabilities to, to ensure that you're not breaking your, your, your operational world. Yeah. And, 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 and so, you know, one way to reframe what census does as opposed to pipelines is actually kind of a continuous deployment tool for data. And, and it has all of the, you know, the needs there that, that, that yeah, hundred percent. And actually I want to uh, like extra emphasize what you are saying about like the difference between reading and writing from a SaaS application and something that I want to add, um, and like, uh, make sure that, um, our audience like is aware of is that actually, ah, by the way, Claire did something very right. She named it ETL and not ELT. Right. And that's, that's, yeah, but that's very, very important because right. the fact that we can do ELT, which means we extract whatever we, we can and just load it and dub it there. And then we can have models that we version on DBT or whatever. Mm -hmm. We can go back and fix problems. If we have problems, it's huge. And we right. don't realize that. If you go like to an ETL engineer that was working, I don't know, with Oracle systems 30 years ago, they had the same problems that you had because everything was so costly, but transformation is something that can destroy something, especially yeah. if you do it like on the fly, right? So yeah. uh, as, exactly as you said, like it's a completely different, I mean, mathematically, it is like the same thing. Uh, but in terms of the engineering that you need to put there, it's like, it's very, very, uh, yep. different. Yep. And, you know, look, I'm a, I'm a, I think a lot about, you know, product a, a, as an experience as well. And if you think of the, the, the user that is trying to pull data into a warehouse, right. That, that the ELT scenario that we've been all kind of very familiar with for the last decade, if you think about what they're trying to accomplish, almost all of them it's in the name, right? It's analysis. They're, they're trying to pull the in so they can do some kind of analysis. How much money did we make? How much money could we make? <laughs> you know, like it usually comes back to one of those two things. Uh, uh, um, and, and, and so the, the, the use case is very, like there's lots of kinds of analysis, but it's analysis. Whereas in our user, analysis is not the goal. <laughs> the goal is operations, right? Yeah. It's automating something. It's, hey, I want to send emails to send a promotion about uh, a, a shoe that you should buy, but tied to the specific segment of users that are likely to not retain if we don't send them this shoe, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so you're trying to get fine-grained detail into your email system, but not, not to do a spreadsheet, right? So that an email comes out or a sales call comes out or a, a better support experience comes out. Like that is a very different end user need. And so I think when the person wakes up in the morning and opens up, our tool versus opens up uh, um, uh, an ELT product. 
they're, they're, what they're thinking about is different. Like, I think they're, they're actually just, just trying to solve different problems. Quick question before yeah. uh, uh, Eric comes, uh, asks his question. Uh, <laughs> are the users different between uh, a Fivetran user and the census user? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you, you see the same thing as I do in, in terms of data teams range dramatically in size. Yes. So I, uh, I admire the crap out of like a lot of our users who are, you know, data teams of one who <laughs> like, you know, they, 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 uh, they are, uh, you know, th three things in one body, so to speak. Uh, uh, and, um, and so they, they are the, they pull the data in, they model the data, they push the data out, they do all of it in their own, it, it, all on their own. But, but I think when, when a data team grows, it actually ends up being uh, different people. Yeah. Because the, the, there is a user who is, you could think of it as like, almost like maybe the concept, what, what are people getting? You remember you used to talk about the forward deployed engineer. Remember that concept? Mm -hmm. It was a Palantir that first started using that term. Uh, I think data teams now have all sorts of roles, right? There's the core platform building kind of people. There's uh, ML who, you know, people just sitting there doing like really cool analyses that hopefully are worth the money. I don't know. Uh, um, and, and then there's this kind of forward deployed analyst, let's call it. You, you, your job is actually not just to sit there and pontificate on what is revenue, uh, but actually to go help the marketing team, the sales team, and the support team to do, to, 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 to improve the operational excellence of the company. Mm -hmm. And and so, yeah, I think that person might on a different week be doing something related to five training and analysis. But on a day-to-day, -day, I think at scale, your data team, this is actually different sets of people, yeah. Mm -hmm. Eric, all yours. You saw me chomping into bit. Uh, so... <laughs> Boris, I'm interested in what I'll call maybe like the the chicken and egg problem a little bit. And mm. I'll lead in by, I was thinking the other day, like Google Analytics is still so pervasive, but relative to what's available now, it's so primitive in many ways. I mean, right. J4 is a little bit better, but I was thinking about it and it's like, okay, well, part of the reason is because like you have sort of have packaged collection and visualization and disaggregating those things creates really big challenges on both sides, right? And so like, okay, it just people kind of go to it. So you think about Fivetran and it's like, point. okay, well, I'm taking, you know, data with largely known schemas and dumping it into a place that can ingest known schemas, like, you know, whatever, schemas is great. When you think about like the practical, I want to send emails or I want a salesperson to prioritize something, mm -hmm. there's an assumption, I think, that there's been some sort of value created beyond the initial dump into the warehouse. Yeah. And I'm just interested to know, like, how do you approach that is because every business's data is different, different metrics, like, you know, all that sort of stuff. Are you like reaching into the warehouse and trying to enable the creation of that value? I mean, tons of companies are doing it with DBT, but like, in many ways, you need to have something to send that isn't there when the right. data arrives yeah. in five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is a. This might be my my favorite question and topic and and, and thing to think about. Um, you have to generate some kind of IP. <laughs> your, your That's a company, way more succinct way to say it. <laughs> yeah, and, and so I think if a company has two kinds of IP, like there is the widget that you make. <laughs> And how you sell it and market it and support it and you know all the kind of yeah th those are both a kind of IP right and our 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 industry focuses like ninety nine percent on how to how to make better widgets and how to how to you know the source code is your ultimate IP and all these things yeah and I think uh, all of this call it you know how the sausage is made how it's sold how it's supported how it's marketed it is absolutely IP. Hmm. And if you have none, if, if the way you, if the way you, uh, uh, send an email about, uh, uh, you know, promotions about your shopping cart are, can be solved by, you know, your Stripe, you know, automatic, uh, shopping cart reminder checkbox. If I don't know if they have that, but let's say they did, um, yeah. then great. Then you don't need any of these things, right? Like you have no, you have no IP of your own. Right. Um, so I guess that puts the onus a little bit on companies actually thinking about what makes them unique. But here's the, so this is, 
here's what's happening and has been happening for years now. Um, I think your point about Google Analytics being kind of all encapsulated is actually a really good metaphor for this entire modern data stack, right? We tend to think about the modern data stack as uh, all these various tools and the phases, right? And the data comes in and then it's transformed and it's, you know, all these things. But in a way, the modern data stack is taking every single SaaS app and putting them, you know, making them fall on their side, right? It's like, so Google mm. Analytics ingests data, stores data, renders, like visualizes data, allows you to query the data, uh, reports on the data, like it models the data, right? It has everything in the app. And the repeat that times thousands of applications. And so as long as everything you need can be done inside that silo, then, then those products are great. And what the modern data stack does in some ways is just like reinventing that. It's like, well, now we can ingest all applications into one single storage layer. Okay. And then you can store everything in one place. You can uh, uh, visualize it all in one way. So is that a useful architecture versus, you know, 30 apps that each implement their own end-to-end -end data uh, stack? And I think the key question there is, does your IP involve joining data? Hmm. And if it doesn't, then this entire modern data stack could actually be, you could potentially throw it out, right? And be like, we have a billing system. All of our information about uh, how much money we made is in the billing system. You can query the billing system. All that matters is then the question, does the billing system give me like an interface that I can render and visualize and query? And if they don't, then of course, then you need to pull the data out so you can query it, right? But see, this is, I think, the transition. Once upon a time, people were pulling data out into their database, their data warehouse, because you couldn't query Stripe using SQL, right? Right, yep. But that's going to change. All of them are going to increase how they you know, make their data queryable. But what you can never do is from inside Stripe or Google Analytics, join and query data, right? So that's yeah. not possible. And so that is what uniquely the data warehouse and the data stack does. So then is there insight? Is there insight for your various teams that comes from joining data together? Well, in the real world, always, right? The, 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 um, your, your sales prioritization uh, example or your marketing email, right? Those two examples, you could tie that to product activity. Well, that's one source of data. That's assuming your entire product is in one database, which it almost never is nowadays, right? So it could be multiple <laughs> services yeah. of data. It's going to also be tied to financial information about that customer, which comes from what? Well, some kind of invoicing data, right? Which might be one billing system, might be multiple, right? It's going to be tied to their level of engagement with your team. So that might be your support data is getting joined into that as well. And that's just me kind of like rattling these along, right? I bet you the best companies have really interesting ways of modeling, you know, their users, their customers, their value, uh, uh, whether that's to forecast it or to automate it or whatever. So yes. I think the longest short of it is yes. Uh, you, <laughs> um, uh, uh, when you use census, you, the goal is not to just take something from five trend into your warehouse and then back out into sales with no, with no intermediate sure. step. If, if th then I don't know what you're doing. Uh, then you're just, you're getting the base value, which is like, I can take something from one app and put it into another app, which is still good. Right. So take like a Zendesk metric, dump it into your warehouse and then take it from the warehouse and put it into Salesforce. Like that's still something. And I actually think it's a better architecture than connecting those apps directly. Yeah, because you sure. at least have a you at least have a hub. Yep. But I think real value, yeah. What that person again, if you're just setting up a pipeline that's raw to raw, then yeah, yeah, your job is not that interesting. Yeah. But the reason we employ data teams is is that they're actually sitting there going, I think I could take these very disparate pieces of information clean them, distill them, merge them, and come up with new valuable insight. One quick follow-up question, because I know I, I know I want to leave enough time for Costas uh, yeah. to ask about the term data federation, because <laughs> he and sure. I talk about that all the time, and sure. he has some really interesting thoughts. But what are the ways that you see, I love the, um, the paradigm of IP. Uh, what are the ways that you see companies creating that? And I'll just, the 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 context behind that question is, I mean, 
some of the most interesting ways I see that happening is through tools like DBT, where you're mm-hmm. sort of creating like interesting models. Of course, I think there are a lot of companies who just maybe even write SQL on the warehouse to perform the joins to create those data Without sets. a doubt, tons. tons. What else are you seeing though? Like how are companies creating that IP? Is there anything interesting in the way that that IP is being generated in the context of those joins? Right. So I think it's always helpful, first of all, to step back and remember that we are very, very, very deep in the, you know, most cutting edge, sophisticated companies. For sure. Uh, yeah. And to your point, Google Analytics is still so widely deployed, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so the majority of this does not happen in DBT, does not happen in, 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 in all these places. Uh, but there is business logic everywhere. There's business logic everywhere. So there's the query that you wrote ad hoc in your database. Yes. There is, there is if, if we were to be really honest, probably the largest repository of these kinds of, uh, of this kind of logic, this kind of query is not in, in, in DBT and GitHub, which is, I think that's what's great there is it's starting to become a better repository for this. Yep. I really hope our entire industry moves towards that model. But it's probably, and don't freak out, uh, in Salesforce, Sockle queries and Apex code. <laughs> I agree with you wholeheartedly, actually. <laughs> and 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 I think the traditional, you know, kind of if we think about the sophistication stages, right? They're crossing sure. the chasms, et cetera, et cetera, right? Silicon Valley and and broadly speaking, software companies have moved to this new paradigm, right? Yep. Because because their most important signals come from their software, and your CRM doesn't store that. So, so the data warehouse is the, is the perfect kind of uh, query engine and storage and computation layer for that information. You know, the number of signals that we generate, I don't even know how many events the average you know, kind of software company generates now, but it's, it's a lot, right? Like yep. that, that is why we, we, we store these things there now. But if you think of non-software companies, which again, eventually everyone will be a software company, right? So, so sure. this is why it's like, <clears throat> you, you, we all skate to where the puck is going. There are still furniture companies in the world, right? And you would probably find that the bulk of the intelligence, the IP that I'm talking about, lives kind of glommed onto their Salesforce instance in a collection of maybe checked in, probably not checked in code, code that looks like queries sometimes, like Salesforce has yep. a query language called Sockle, or it's more imperative code like Apex. And 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 you know the, the the real goal of census is to kind of move that into a kind of get back uh, uh, kind of open standard language called SQL. Yeah. Uh, and 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 yeah, that's that's I think the journey that we're going to see over the next end. But it'll take like I'm talking like easily a decade plus. Oh sure. Um, yeah. People, we we all in our industry, and it's why we're so exuberant and why we all raise all these capital is like, yeah. we think these things happen much faster than, than, than they do. Um, yep. you know, I started my first company, like, like I said, 10 years ago on a very simple premise that was about, uh, if we're all going to live in SAS, you need to have, uh, your employee identity, your password, your login, like centralized and federated, right? It seems to make sense. You can't have 8,000 passwords, right. In, in a company that's not checked. Like that doesn't work. Yeah. It's been over a decade. Uh, and we're still in the infancy of that market. Yeah. Like that's how long these things take. Uh, and so I think data we're, we're very much in the For sure. early stage. Yeah. Back in, uh, when I was, uh, doing consulting, we used to joke about, you know, companies of all types and sizes is like, okay, I've never seen a sales force. That's not like some sort of Frankenstein. <laughs> and it's easy to talk down to that. Right. Uh, because it's actually very painful, right? Like it does create pain, but in reality, like it's pretty advanced for a lot of the companies doing it and enables them to accomplish things that are re- like, what else can they do? I mean, of course, Absolutely. like the modern data stack, but like it is very helpful and it is pretty advanced to be able to customize all of this business logic uh, inside of the tool. So I, that's such a helpful yeah. perspective. Yeah. And I think there's going to be this interesting, like, cascade, right? So I think the data community has so much still, and it's exciting, right? That's why we're all of us, a lot of us work in this space. And there's so much to distill from the world of engineering, of software engineering down into, let's call it the broader world of data. So now 
thank thank goodness, but like we're still at the early days of everyone realizing that you could treat your your queries as a piece of code that can be versioned, right? Yeah, that, that's still it. We're still at the beginning of that, right? <laughs> uh, and then there's going to be all the other things that go around uh, uh, the, the software development lifecycle for data. And even there, we have to get quite a bit more sophisticated, right? Um, if we're going to support these kinds of workflows. So I'll give you an example. One of the reasons you're ran, because if the cascade is like software engineering, let's call it to data organizations and then down to business organizations. So if you think of that Salesforce that you were, you saw in your consulting days, everyone always says, you're right. It's a mess. It's a mess. It's got all sorts of stuff. There's like a field called blah, 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 underscore two, you know, it's like there's tons of them, <laughs> tons of them. But what, how many people in the modern data stack actually run like something equivalent to a migration when their data scheme has changed, right? Very few, if not none. And so we still have to, you know, get more sophisticated in how we manage data in, in the core, let's call it. Uh, but as we do, I think a lot of that will then be able to have this amazing downstream effect on, on the rest of the business. Yeah. I, I really, you really made me think, Boris, with uh, the comment that you made about uh, um, Salesforce and the business logic there, because you remind me of something extremely painful, mm -hmm. uh, which is if and how you can replicate the results of formulas uh, on Salesforce mm. to the warehouse. So I don't know if like Fiverr is doing it today or like they figured out how to do it, but it's pretty much impossible because right. like the piece of logic there, which is executed whenever you make an API call, right? And that's like, I think- That's a beautiful uh, microcosm, by the way, of this whole thing. You're absolutely right. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah, but, the, and that's like the thing, and I think that's what justifies and makes this category of reverse ETL or whatever we want to call it like important because at the end, you might be able to export the data from Salesforce, but the business logic is not something that you can export. Like you need exactly. someone to replicate it, which is a completely different story, right? Exactly. exactly. So uh, you need to get the data out, but that's not enough. You need also whatever you are going to do with this data to push it back again, right? And these systems are like, I mean, many times I'm, I say uh, like, when you get like a salesperson, you can ask many things from the salesperson, but like you cannot ask them to leave the sales force. That's where they live. They don't Correct. want to learn about new tools. <laughs> they don't care about that stuff. The only thing that they care about is their quota. And like, and that's what they should do. Like they shouldn't care. Like why they should care about like whatever shiny technology we have. Yep. Right. Like they would be engineers if they cared about Costa, that. But there's versioning, man. It's awesome. Ah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you're right. It's a new table. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. No, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a, it's, it's a people, what's the term people like, you know, people live in their pane of glass, right? And, and, yeah. and it's just like, you can't get them out of there. Yeah, um, yeah. And I, I think yeah. there were like some attempts to like do that with stuff like Looker, for example. Like yes. The, the yes. previous version of like uh, BI tools where we're like, yeah, ask your salespeople to go and like work from within uh, Looker, and then there will be links to go back to Salesforce. Like, no, why? Why? Because do you why? know who suffers from this the most? It, it's actually kind of tech founders in the valley because they start their company and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah I got Looker. My salespeople are just going to go there, and it's because like they're also deluded yeah. because they see this as easy, <laughs> right? Because you and I can do it, and and I'm like, no, they're they're not, man. They're really not. I promise you they're not and he's like it's easy like for sure they're gonna do that like i can do it <laughs> and i was like uh-huh uh-huh this is and it, it sometimes takes years for them to realize like oh yeah i hired a vp sales yeah and like they, they ended up doing their own thing i'm like uh-huh uh-huh they do their own thing they do their own thing <laughs> so it's it's uh so i think yeah tech founders particularly i think suffer from from not seeing this yeah yeah because it's also like extremely easy to burn money actually it's like one of the reasons that you exist so sure why not pay 50 grand to buy like a license for this thing, right? So yeah, anyway, that's that's another very interesting conversation that we need to do some at some point. But um, yeah, that was like a very, very uh, like interesting point that you made there. But I want to go, uh, you use like the term federation. Mm -hmm. Eric mm -hmm. mentioned that I want to ask about that. But 
traditionally and like from if you're just like an engineer, like federation and DTL are like two completely different things. Yes. So actually, the opposite. Like when you are talking about federation, it's more about no, I'm not going like to collect the data into one place. I'm going like to ask its data source, and then I will federate the results and present the results. It's true. Uh, so, if this is like what you are thinking of, like the solution, or unless you have like a different definition, would be more than happy to uh, discuss about that. Where do we stand today and where do you see going, right? Yeah. Like, because today, I don't know, like technically speaking, this is not federation that we have. No, no, no. I think you're, you're, that's a very reasonable uh, technical pushback. Um, so let me start with uh, uh, an analogy I tend to use with my team, but it's going to make, it's, you're going to appreciate it because I think you, you're close enough in age to me, but um, I'm starting to notice that like younger people are like, what is he talking about? Um, <laughs> So your laptop, your, your, your computer has an operating system in it. Uh, and it provides a lot of things for you, the user, and for the applications that are built on it, right? And uh, I, I think that when we move to the web, there are certain things that we kind of lost along the way. Uh, we gained a lot, so that's fine. Uh, but we've, we lost a few things along the way. So one is login, right? So when you log into your computer, you log in once, and then like you don't open Word and go, please log in. Yeah. Uh, you don't open Photoshop or whatever and says, please log in. Please with caveats that everyone now is a web web app. So like that's different now, but but let's put a pin in that. Uh, uh, um, so so that was, you know, your your identity, your user identity was just given as part of the operating system to all the other applications. So so the the they just were receivers of that knowledge and just used it. Uh, and in the same way, there's a file system in your operating system, right? Your computer has a file system. And when you open a file in Word and you want to open that in Excel, like it's the same file. They don't both have to implement a file system to be able to read and write data. And so I think when we moved to the web, we lost both of these things. Yep. Uh, uh, and funny enough, both companies I've started are solving these two things. And so uh, when I think of data federation, the reason I use that term is I think that in order to have a wealth of SaaS applications exist, which is what I want, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're going to always hit this uh, natural friction around uh, replicating the data correctly and consistently, right? Because it's a distributed system and they all want to speak this, about the same things. So this is just, you're always, the more apps you have, the, that all speak roughly about the same things. You're going to have, you know, master data management problems. You're going to have all the things that, you know, kind of as a, as a distributed systems minded software engineer, you can think through and they're hard and it only gets worse for every N plus one application you want to use. And so I think there's only two ways in the long run that this gets resolved. One is the one I don't want, which is everything gets progressively acquired and uh, by by larger companies, mm -hmm. uh, and because then they can create that integration, right? They can create the tight integration between Slack and Salesforce. I'm sure they will. Uh, um, and and Microsoft is and I, maybe it's because I started my career at Microsoft that I saw this because Microsoft is basically the best company in history at doing this, yeah. uh, having built unbelievably great technology to to do interoperation between its applications. And they do this because they can work together. And they can force Excel to, to, to do something that then Word will also abide by. Um, and so that's one option. And we see this, right? The more we get uh, uh, in the later stages of, of SaaS, which is now year 20 of SaaS, right? Like we see these pressures. And the only alternative that I think of is that for some of these things where you need the consistent, you need to come up with a different model than just independently replicating the data in, in bespoke ways in every application. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I use the term data federation, because I believe that as a company, if you want to use the maximum number of SaaS applications uh, with the most freedom and not to be tied to one vendor, you want to be able to own your data and then seamlessly have it be usable in any application. Mm -hmm. So today, my only option to be able to enable that world for people is to say, okay, what is a place? Let's work from first principles, right? Well, you need to store all the data in a way that is like, the most cost-effective and scalable data warehouses. Like 
it's that or S3, right? It's like like either just raw storage or a data warehouse. Like those are your those are the best tools we have from first print. If something better came along, I'll take it, right? But right now, that is what's best. And then I want seamless ability to use that data from any application. If I could eliminate the data pipelines and just say, you know, your app is built directly off the data, that'd be great. But because of the way OLAP, you know, uh, uh, warehouses are designed, because of the the incentive structures in the market today, you can't, you don't get that, right? So you you there are tools, by the way, in like Salesforce has this concept. They're the only one, but they have this concept of like external objects where you can have an external back data store, but it's slow, and then you don't get all the features, and you don't get the formulas, and you don't get the indexes, and you don't get all the things. Yep. So thus, what Census does, which is we will push the data into the internal file system of each of those products, thus turning them into a kind of high performance cache on a single data store. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's what I mean by data federation. Yeah, no, no, make, makes total sense. Uh, I have a, uh, but it's not exactly like a product uh, question. It's more like, um, it's probably like a, yeah, it is a product question, but it has more to do with like uh, the experience of building a product. Actually. Sure, sure. So since you first launched uh, Census yeah. until today, yeah. what you have learned you mm. by building this, uh, this product? Like? Great question. I think I would say that I've learned the most about our users, right? And, and, and data teams as a whole. And so it's been really fun to, to, to watch them on this journey uh, uh, over the last three years, just working with people. Uh, and so I will, I've, I've talked about this before, I think, but I, I, it really is the thing that always comes to mind, uh, which the, you know, the first experience I had when we, when we started selling this to, to users was, hey, like, great, this is going to save me time, or this allows me to do the thing that I didn't know how to build. I don't know how to write this kind of connector. So it's great. I write SQL. I don't know how to write Python. You know, it's like, that was the initial uh, kind of experience we had. And that was not surprising. That was not something I was like, ah, what a discovery I've made. But then, and we talked a bit about this, but it became very visceral to me. After a little while of, especially in the early days, our early users using our software, but now it's become kind of, it happens more often. Uh, I started seeing a very unusual reaction from our users that actually caused me real uh, pain. Like I was worried. I was actually really like, are we screwing up here? What's this? this seems bad. These are bad. These are not the words you want to hear from a user, right? Mm-hmm. You want to hear excitement, power, enjoyment, right? And multiple customers started using effectively expressions of fear. Mm-hmm. They started like l- genuinely saying I'm scared in so many words. One, one, one customer is like, was like, this is, I feel like I'm holding a machine gun, like mm-hmm. verbatim. I was like, well, that's not the feeling I want to engender in you. But, you know, so I could have shied away from that. I could have been really freaked out, but, but I started to think about it. And what I realized is census is, this is what I mean by it's not just a data pipeline. It, it's giving these users a power they've never had before. Yeah. Right. The power to do analysis is not new. It's massively improved with great tools, but the ability to analyze data is something they always had, mm-hmm. but the ability to, from your vantage point on the data organization to cause a marketing email to get sent, to cause a, a salesperson to wake up in the morning and with a task to call this person th- that did not exist before census. Yeah. And of course it's scary. <laughs> like, now it's your fault if something breaks yeah. or and <laughs> breaking would be ideal. Like if census like said, Hey, sorry, the pipeline can't go today. That's, that's not even, that's, that's actually bad, but nowhere near the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is you push bad data, extra data, data that, that is like going to be embarrassing uh, when it goes out. Right. And so that was the emotion that we're trying to get, convey to me. And, and so now I spend a lot of time really thinking about how can we build capability and census that improves your confidence, right? So, so I think this is the point, right? Like in, we have a lot of experience in the world of software on how to be agile, but safe, right? Code reviews, uh, uh, um, 
testing, unit testing, like just decades and decades of research and, and, and experience, uh, uh, practical experience on, on doing this. And so I think of census as one of our jobs to, to be done, both in the software and in our marketing, in our education, in our content, right? Yep. Is to try to teach how to make this less scary, but also to embrace a little bit of the fear, right? Because if you, if you, I don't want people to go back to, I'm only going to press the go button once a year because it's like, I don't want to break things. Yeah. Um, and so that's probably the biggest thing I've, I've learned is the, the biggest hindrance to deploying census is actually helping people overcome this new responsibility, this fear that comes with it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, but on the other side is, is, is so much power, so much growth, so much more your team will be able to do. Uh, and so you should embrace it, but it is like, it's genuinely scary. And so it's, that's a first yeah. in my life to, to have built a product that freaks 100%. people out. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I, I mean, it's a good problem to have, uh, yeah. because of course, like it's, uh, I think an indication of like, the value that, um, I'll give you, I'll give you an example in how, how this manifests speaking of product thing to like a very narrow, you know, cause I think this is not solved with one giant, my marketing team is going to hate me. Like, one giant whiz bang feature that you can announce, right? Yeah. It's it's a collection of very like fine grain thinking, like small features here and there. And so mm-hmm. I'll give you an example. So uh, there are a lot of products that when you write into them, to, to your point about like reading and writing is very different. They they have uh, there's a term in compilers, you know, about there's defined behavior, uh, and then there's undefined behavior, and then there's unspecified behavior, which is actually like a different thing. Which just means like it'll work, but I can't tell you what's going to happen. Yep. Uh, so when you write duplicates into some system, not all, that's the beauty of it, right? We support like 50 different applications and like all different, you know, di- different uh, behaviors. Some of them will behave in very unusual ways when you sync duplicates. So some of them will reject it. Some of them will just pick one and you won't know which one, right? Yeah. And so that is something when we, when we built the very first version of Census all those years ago, we just said here, let's take the table and like just efficiently, our goal was to get speed. So it was like, let's get it as efficiently as possible into the destination. Yep. And then we didn't know like, oh, turns out people are, people have plenty of duplicates. Like the warehouse is not enforcing, you know, uh, 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 <laughs> unique IDs. So yep. they're seeing duplicates. And like, we were like powering through, we're like super fast, like, yay, go sync millions of duplicates, no problem. And then you're back to the same old problem of like the sales team or the support team or the, you know, the success team or the marketing team is like, I don't, this data is wrong. Screw the data team. Let's go back to doing our own thing. I don't like these guys. Yeah. And so now we've added the capability. Like there's a, there's a, it's a built in, right? You can't turn it off, which is we will block duplicates from being synced. Like we will block them because even there are some people who are like frustrated by this. Cause it's like, it's errors that they're like, but it's not an error, but it was like, but we're going to treat it like an error. Cause like you don't, you're not realizing this has annoying downstream effects on your team. Mm. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's a million things like that that we, we've had to kind of invest in. Yeah, I totally, I, I totally get that. Like, I think what people don't, there are like two things that I think people don't realize when they uh, start using products like sensors. Uh, one is that the sensors team has to learn to work with a technology that is completely opaque. Right, mm-hmm. like you have Salesforce on the other side, and it's very interesting. I remember uh, I was talking with one of uh, the lead engineers in uh, Salesforce mm-hmm. uh, about uh, building um, Heroku Connect when they acquired sure. Heroku. Sure. And the guy was like, "We were building this thing, and they were like cases that we couldn't predict, even big inside." Salesforce, like they were like edge cases that we couldn't replicate by having access to the whole infrastructure and right. all the knowledge that like Salesforce itself has, right? Uh, so imagine now that you have Boris and his team and they try like to interoperate with Marketo. I don't know how yeah. many people have oh, worked with Marketo, oh, but I mean, <laughs> is there a, is there an off the record version of this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the best. I mean, it's the dominant market pla- market, marketing platform and for a good reason, I'm sure. But like, in their operating with it is like a completely different uh, thing. Like there are errors that are not documented. There are like, behaviors that they are not documented. And they are not documented for a very good reason because like all these APIs that were not built like for Boris and his team to send Exactly. Data, 
right? Like they have like a completely different specification. Uh, that's one thing that people keep to forget, I think. The other thing that they keep to forget is that as we add more and more systems into this stack or architecture mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. we are actually building a super complicated distributed system. Right. And distributed systems have like some very specific rules, like, and delivery semantics are like something that it might sound like very theoretical, but it's actually very, very practical. And I don't expect anyone in sales to know that one of the ways that we can deal with that is to have at least once delivery semantics. Right. right. Yeah, sure. I mean, it doesn't uh, work at the end. Like this, Costa, right? Costa, so, I'm getting PTSD. I remember using the word eventual consistency in front of a marketing team and they were like, no, no, we need it. We, we can't have it be eventual. And I'm like, <laughs> it has to be eventual. <laughs> the speed of light is not negotiable. And like, oh, that's what you mean? I'm like, because in their brain, eventual meant like it'll come up tomorrow. And I'm like, <laughs> I was like, wow, I forgot that this is a term that we use in distributed systems that has not nowhere near the same meaning. Also, yeah. it goes both ways. Real time doesn't mean real time uh, to a lot of people. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And the reason I'm saying that is because I think there's like a very important element, and that's uh, that's we are all responsible for being in this market, and that's education. Like, we need to make sure that, like, outside of building, like, actually, I think that like, it might sound a little bit exaggerated, but part of the product is also education. Like I how agree. we can help people understand what they can do and how they can do it with their, uh, with their technology, because there are limits and engineering is about trade dogs and we have to make these trade dogs. Otherwise, like we are not going to have products that work. Yep. Yep. No, I think that's a, I think interesting products tend to have this educational component and, and, I, I I wholeheartedly agree that that's part of the the journey we're all on. And especially, again, the world is large. And one of the things I have learned is n the world is nowhere near as sophisticated as people think it is. Oh, yeah. Mm. Uh, I tell people this even more. Like, Silicon Valley is not even as sophisticated as you think it is, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, and, and, like, we work, you, 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 you and I work with some of the best, right? And it's like, sometimes I'm like, wow, you, this is, I remember I, I used to do really fancy demos in the early days. Like really, I would try to drop in words like AI to just, again, <laughs> you're like, yeah, 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 like you need all these things and da, 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 da. And it's like, and then one day out of expedience, I, I didn't have time that day. I did the dumbest version of the census demo. Like this is back in, you know, 2018, 19. I did the dumbest, like where there was like two metrics you could set up in 12 seconds. Like the, count page views. You know what I mean? It was like count page views. <laughs> and then I was like, let's just put that in Salesforce for like a customer success team to know how many times they've visited your product. Like that was it. That was the demo. And I was, I was actually concerned like and embarrassed for them at first. Cause I was like, they were in awe. Like people were like, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And I was like, this isn't the, what, what? <laughs> This is the basics. This is not the this is not the wow demo. This is not the wow demo. Like why why are you guys wowing? And and it's like you forget how how yeah. starved people are for this, right? And then yeah. you're right. It goes hand in hand with then you start delivering stuff and then they yeah, you have to we have to find a way to we're going to have to do a book like distributed systems for 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 regular people. Uh cuz um yeah, yeah. Uh, uh <laughs> just, just cuz it's because I think it's too intuitive for you and I, like it, it, we know it so well that we take it for granted. And, and then you end up in these weird miscommunications and think about, I think the need to educate is doubly so because you are right that we need to educate just to serve our own users, right? Like think of what Fishtown DBT have to do, right? To, to teach yes. the concept of version control is like super valuable. Just to teach that is unbelievably valuable. And if I think about what we're doing is we're turning the data team into this kind of like company platform team. So we need to help them explain what's happening to everybody else. Mm. Otherwise they will, they will be, they will also fail. So we have to act as like their advocates to the rest of the company. And like, that's super essential. So you're right. The education is unbelievably important. Yep. 100%. Yep. Hopefully these conversations help. Oh, this is great. Boris, this has been such a fun conversation. Brooks actually let us run a little bit long, which is super fun um, yeah. when we get permission to do that. But, uh, but we're at time here. This has been such a fun conversation, really helpful for me and, and I think definitely for our listeners as well. So thanks for the time. 
first of all, I have to say that Boris is so articulate. I find myself jealous of his ability to explain complex things and even dip, dip into the world of, you know, sort of formal computer science in a way that's so accessible. So, A, I appreciated that and learned a ton from him. Uh, my takeaway uh, is around the way that he described uh, sort of uh, value that's created in the warehouse as it relates to uh, data that's transformed, say, for downstream tools, um, sort of creating value with data, right? And he described that as any data that needs to be joined in order to produce some sort of valuable asset, he described that as IP, um, which I think is such a helpful way to frame the concept of creating whatever kind of value we're creating in the warehouse, right? Whether it's a unified customer profile or packaging some sort of analytical component from one business unit and sharing it with another. Uh, so I really, I just really appreciated that. I think it's been helpful for me to think through that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, okay, it was like an amazing conversation I think we had with him in general. Uh, and there are like many insights for someone to take from, uh, from this conversation. Um, what I keep, I really liked how he's using the term federation. Uh, mm. I mean, this was like something that we discussed also uh, during the, um, the show. Um, the, traditionally, Federation has a different meaning, uh, but it makes a lot of sense the way that he's using like the term federation. And uh, that was like very interesting. And it was also like super interesting to discuss with him about like all the challenges around building a product like this. So hopefully we are going to have him again in the future and we have more stuff to chat about. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks uh, again for joining us on the show. Uh, lots of great episodes coming up. So we'll catch you on the next one. Bye.